I don't know about this one. Okay. Uh, we are very pleased uh, today to have uh, visiting us Professor Henry Kepler, who is warden of Wilton Park in Sussex, England. Now the word warden to most Americans has punitive con uh, connotations, but I can assure you the uh, institution over which he presides is anything but punitive in its uh, operation. In fact, many people remem remember it with very, very great pleasure. The Wilton Park uh, Institution uh, was founded by this gentleman, Dr. Kepler, uh, right after World War II. Uh, he received a grant from the uh, Foreign Service in England uh, to conduct uh, courses, we would call them short courses, I suppose, here on um, explaining to former uh, German prisoners of war some of the operation of a democratic system. And so their charge at that time was to simply to uh, try to establish a dialogue with the common people in Germany as to how the system of democracy operates, and in particular, the system in England. This grew to the point that other people began to be included, and in fact, Americans started to come, partly attracted by the fact that the Wilton Park uh, eventually became uh, an institution housed in a manor house. So that's a very large mansion in southern England. It's about 55 miles south of London, about five miles from the ocean, on a beautiful plot of land with, with beautiful gardens, formal gardens, and farms around. And this house was operated in a rather grand manner, as a wonderful Bavarian cook, who I understand is still there. The meals were superb, the company was superb, and eventually Americans, uh, Germans, uh, all sorts of nations were sending delegates to this institution for these short courses. The short courses at this time run 26 weeks out of the year. And they're about two weeks long, generally and they are superbly organized. The people who come are often uh, foreign service officers from various nations. The people come from posts everywhere around the world and they all have wonderful stories to tell and wonderful opinions to offer. The discussion groups at the time I was there in 1969, for example, had the subject um, uh, te technolo technological change, ex technological exchange between America and Europe. That was the title of my group. But all sorts of titles having to do with international relations are chosen as the subjects of these two-week short courses. And then uh, very prestigious people are invited uh, as speakers to the Wilton Park uh, conferences. They're, they're handled just superbly in terms of organization. Uh, there's a lecture in the morning there are usually discussion groups, smaller discussion groups in the afternoon with some free time out for climbing around the downs and visiting the seashore. And then the evening, there is another invited speaker. And such people as Heath from England, I remember, came down to speak to us. Uh, all sorts of foreign ambassadors who happen to be in the area are invited to speak. And it really is quite an exciting affair, especially for someone like me who hardly knew anything except a smattering of nuclear physics to be allowed to participate in such a group. But as a result of this, uh, we still have friends with whom we correspond. Uh, we have friends who come to Ames to visit us, having met them at Wilton Park. And in fact, the people from Wilton Park, those people who've been there, for some reason or other, have an enormous uh, camaraderie with each other. For example, in America, there are 900 alumni of these Wilton Park conferences. And here in Ames, we have more than a dozen people who have been there. And uh, I don't understand uh, really what it is that draws us together, but we get together almost annually and, and show pictures, so show our slides to each other. We all took pictures of the same thing. <laughs> uh, but we all have stories to tell to recount. Well, the person 
whose magnetism, I think, is responsible for this cohesion of this group of alumni is the warden. And uh, Mr. Kepler is a distinguished gentleman indeed. He received his PhD from, or DPhil from Oxford, and I, I uh, maybe get you to believe that the list of honors he's received is about as long as this printed page. Uh, he has been a visiting professor at Oxford, at Heidelberg, in Ohio State University, Indiana University, in history and political sciences. At the present time, he's making a tour through the United States. Uh, he has been in, in New York, Connecticut, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Missouri. He's now at Ames. Uh, he is going to California from here, and he will then come back through Kentucky and Massachusetts and home. Uh, the, yeah, I have such things in this list as recipient of the University of Wisconsin President's Medallion for Service to International <coughs> Education. But there is a, a very long list of uh, fellowships which he has earned. These Wilted Park conferences are amazing. I think the thing which amazes the Americans the most is the fact that Warden Kepler will sit up as master of the discussion, and he will engage in repartee with a delegate from Italy, in Italian, from Germany, in German, in France, France and French. And of course, uh, I think he has other languages as well and under his command. And uh, the whole faculty at the Wilton Park uh, Manor House are all multilingual. And of course, that to an American like me who barely passed his PhD examinations in French and German uh, is, is something quite wonderful, that they can actually understand, converse. And the discussion groups, which they break up into every afternoon, have, there's a discussion group in German, a discussion group in Italian possibly, or in French. And any one of the faculty of Wilton Park is competent to lead the discussion in any one of the languages. Well. I'd like to get on now to Dr. Kepler. Uh, I'm sorry, I have forgotten the exact title of his speech tonight, but it's on the general subject of international understanding, and I'd simply like to ask Dr. Kepler up here to start speaking. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for your overkind words. I only hope you made reference to my languages. I only hope that my American will be understood in this uh, uh, hall. Um, I uh, would like to say how very glad I am to be in Ames again and uh, how much I appreciate the sterling work of Dr. Lowry in uh, organizing this. I am, uh, in a way, amazed to have uh, so large an audience because it's been my experience that for very understandable reason, Americans at the moment are preoccupied with uh, their own affairs and uh, to get an audience amongst whom I'm delighted to see so many alumni and uh, their wives, but uh, a great number of people whom I don't know here is uh, in a way encouraging. The title which I had chosen was a pun. It was old friends and new relations. Now, um, I remember a song of uh, Tom Lehrer's, that uh, distinguished mathematician from the Massachusetts <laughs> Institute, um, who has uh, not only wit but great perception, and he was uh, making some song about the uh, perennial friendship which the Americans, for example, had had with the Germans at uh, uh, the Americans taught the Germans a lesson in 1914, and they have hardly bothered us since then. Um, but it is, of course, too, that the basis of the relationship in which we, under which we are living today is indeed one of uh, a friendship for which has been forged by the aftermath of the world, of, the, of World War II, and what one is concerned with are the new relations, as they are evolving, have to evolve in this relationship. 
Now, I want to take right at the beginning the, uh, a few theses which I believe uh, are underlining it. I do not claim that uh, they are particularly original. Um, Tyron once, once said, what goes without saying goes much better than it's being said. And therefore, I do think that the question of the new relations amongst old friends must be based on a recognition that the whole field of international and domestic issues interacts. Now, both President Ford and Secretary of State uh, Kissinger have been kind enough to give me a very recent example of this. The situation of uh, uh, the inflation in this country is clearly a domestic issue, but it is equally li clearly linked to the 400% increase in oil prices, which clearly is a question of international affairs. And I really do believe that since we have so many common problems, which each nation, and I venture to think not even the United States can solve by itself, that we must strive for common management of these common problems. I'm using the term common management rather than something more political, uh, more diplomatic, because I believe it is essentially a matter of fact arrangement which we must establish in the relationships across the Atlantic. And I do believe, and every day that passes, whether you look at the stock exchange or whether you look at uh, world commodity prices or whether you look at the wage price spiral, makes it quite clear that there's no salvation in independent national action. Now, this is very difficult for Americans, and particularly for Americans in the very center of the United States, to accept. But I'm ashamed to say that I find more ready acceptance of this in the United States than in the very small states which now go up to make Western Europe. It's true that many of us have the excuse of history, the idea of a fully sovereign state which could cover and determine its own fate is uh, for countries like France or Britain a century old tradition. But nevertheless, it is, I think, uh, remarkable that a country like the United States, which uh, only defends on 5% for its gross domestic product on exports, seems to be more aware of our interdependence than countries like uh, Britain or France, which have a very much higher sector in which uh, the exporting industries uh, feed and close their people. So those are the basic assumptions, and these indeed will be the conclusions which I have to make, that. Uh, there is a very close interaction. And if Americans sometimes feel, and particularly felt last year, like saying to their friends, look, we have at the moment some domestic bother. We want to switch off foreign affairs, come back in five years, and then we'll play foreign affairs again. This temptation must be resisted not only because America, in her unique position, has an obligation in her own interest not to go into isolation, but because she simply can't do it, because there is this interaction on domestic issues. And I believe, therefore, that we must have common management for common problems, and I will say a little more about that, and we must resist the temptation which after all brought the disaster of the Great Depression in 1931 and ultimately World War II, we must resist the temptation to believe that the national sovereign state is a sufficient unit to solve our domestic and international problems. Now, when we look at the relations across the Atlantic, you find that the most frequent words to describe this relationship are an alliance, a partnership, and a community. Now, alliance has a technical, is a technical term. It refers throughout the centuries of uh, 
treaty relations between sovereign states. And that is the structured part of our Western community or Western partnership. And I shall have to say something about that. But it becomes ever clearer that there are two unstructured parts, not based on formal documents, which do in fact, even more than the structured part, bind us together, create common problems, which must be solved together. Now, the structured part of our Western or Atlantic community is, of course, the NATO alliance. Uh, the unstructured part we find in our common economic, social, and financial problems. And one of the issues which arises from the situation in Western Europe is the unstructured situation of the Western European community. So those are the three main points if put down in a, with a question mark in a fit of depression that perhaps I ought to ask at the end, does Western Europe really concern the United States? Well, I think uh, the fact that you have come here proves that you, at any, believe, at any case, believe it does, and I believe so profoundly. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the NATO relationship. I think I can assume those to be known quite apart from the time factor. But there are two issues which I think deserves your attention, and if you want to raise them later on in the question time, of course, I will do my best to answer them. The first is a fair burden sharing. NATO is a partnership in defense, and uh, every country is tempted, particularly in a time of uh, uh, domestic stringency, to try and save on its defense budget. And this temptation, of course, becomes ever greater the longer we have lived in peace. It's the old story of the man who, for 20 years, paid his fire insurance and then decided that he was wasting his money. I only hope that the Western Alliance won't have the same fate as he had, because when he canceled his insurance contract, his house promptly burned down. But of course, within that alliance, we are all being plagued by statistics. And to the younger members of this audience, I would uh, give one word of gratuitous advice, even at the risk of, the, of offending professors of statistics here. Um, I do believe that with statistics, you have to handle them as if you were handling nitroglycerin. They have their function, but you must really make quite sure that the basis on which your statistics are worked out are the same. Let me give you a very concrete example because it affects all the rest I'm going to say. You have at the moment, according to the American definition of, the, of unemployment, 5.5%. According to the British definition of unemployment, we have 2.5%. And the Germans, according to their definition of the word unemployment, of the term unemployment, have one and a half percent. We would therefore think that Germany has less unemployment than the United States, five and a half against one and a half. In fact, as a proportion of the active labor force, Germany, Britain, and the United States, as of now, have exactly the same proportion of unemployed. In other words, in all the statistics, and if you are interested and intend to work in the international field where statistical comparisons are necessary and frequent, do make sure that you get your basis right. These statistics simply show that there are different definition of the term unemployment. Americans consider a person unemployed who in Germany would not be counted as unemployed. I don't want to go into the details. But I give you that as an example as one of the pitfalls for people who work at Wilton Park or in international relations. 
that we too glibly accept sometimes staggering statistics without looking at their base. And nowhere do you find statistics more, I mustn't say falsifies, but more attuned to the national demand than in the field of defense expenditure. There's one federal country in the alliance apart from the United States where once was given the effect that uh, almost 40% of the federal budget went into defense, which is of course enormous. And when I tried to find out why that was so, I soon found out that the federal budget consists simply of defense and paying for ambassadors and the foreign service. All the rest is in the state budgets. So when the foreign minister, the secretary of state of that particular country comes to the conference table and says, Americans are only spending 7%, we are spending 40%, he's talking nonsense. And it is this issue of what is a fair share which I think is one of the common problems for which we must find common management. I'm not going to go into an analysis of who contributes what. I once had the pleasure to have an extremely intelligent sophomore class at the University of Indiana. You might have heard about Indiana. It's a little further east. And um, they were very good, but they lived under the illusion that the United States paid for all the European armies. Now, while I do agree that the Americans carry a heavy burden within the NATO alliance, it isn't that bad. The British and the Germans and the Belgians and the French, not the French, the French are not in the organization, but the Belgians and the Dutch all relatively play their share, but there's clearly a great deal of argument. Some of you may have seen in the Des Moines Register today a long article on the sale of weapons, which is the, the competition amongst NATO powers for arms procurement. And these are issues which I think uh, are points in our relationship, which we must solve in common. The other issue, and here I think I'm coming to a much more um, difficult subject because I think amongst people who study this field, the burden sharing exercise is generally accepted. The other issue on which I want to comment in the first, the structured part of our relationship, namely the defense one in NATO, is the issue of detente. You remember that a year or two ago, the American administration announced that the period of confrontation with the Soviet Union was over and there was now a period of detente. Now let me say that I never believed in the policy of Chancellor Adenauer of Germany or of Secretary of State Foster Dulles immediately after the war, who thought it possible and right and wise to try and attempt to drive the Russians back to the borders which they had before World War II. This is the period which has become known as the Cold War, and I never was a Cold Warrior. I'm saying that so that you don't misunderstand when I find it one of the tragic illusions that people nowadays seem to think that there really has been a profound change in the relationships of the Atlantic community with the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. There's to me no more tragic example of this than the Norwegian Peace Nobel Prize Committee giving the Nobel Prize jointly to the Vietnamese Foreign Secretary and to your Secretary of State for peace in Vietnam. If it had been a prize given to people who were trying for peace, then it would have been justified. But you see here an example which is common in, in human affairs, that things we wish so much we are inclined to believe have happened. And so it was that I think uh, when uh, the war in Vietnam is going on, 
a peace price, a price acknowledging the achievement of peace in that area, was presented by the Norwegians who together with many other Scandinavian nations, who have many virtues, genuinely believe that something fundamental has changed in our relationship with the Soviet Union. Now, this is the illusion, I believe, of our relationship. And I think it is worthwhile for one moment to look at the reality. And there I think it is true to say, but this was two, five years ago, as it is true now, that clearly neither side, neither the NATO pact nor the Warsaw pact, want war. The full out war in the, with the nuclear equipment for which the chairman, no doubt, has made his scientific contribution, um, is so self-destructive that I think it is safe to assume that uh, not only we in the West, but the Russians equally do not want it. It is also safe to say for anybody who knows Russian history that the Russians are extremely cautious people and do not like to, get, to undertake risks. It's also true to say that if you look at Russian-European relations, you will find that over the centuries has been the West European countries who have invaded the Russians, and not since the 13th century, the peoples in the Russian area to of today invaded the West. There's also another good sign. You may remember, particularly in Iowa, you may remember that in 1972, half your corn disappeared to Russia. They paid for it. I mean, they didn't steal it, it disappeared. But in a way, it was paid for by the American taxpayer, and yet I think it was a very encouraging sign for the world in which we live in, because it meant that the Russian government now did not adopt the attitude adopted in earlier decades, where if the harvest failed, people would just have to starve because the government was not willing to desist in its, to diminish its armament expenditure in order to feed the people. And I myself think it is a healthy sign that in 1972, the Russian leadership decided they would have to spend money on importing food, even if that meant an interference with their plans in other fields. So my view is that uh, there is no danger of an immediate all-out war. On the other hand, for anyone who follows the scene, who sees what the Russians are doing in Spitsbergen, the Norwegian island and high up in the north, vital for the Russian fleet, which in turn has been expended enormously, their action in the Middle East, their demands to Romania to allow them to build a railway from Russia to Bulgaria across Romanian territory, there are very many examples which seem to me to propose only one lesson. It is that the Russians will continue to be careful and not provoke a war as long as they realize that there's a serious risk for them. The moment they believe it is a promenade militaire, it will be a walkover, that I fear sufficient intentions, sufficient evidence, which would prevent us from sleeping safely in our beds. And therefore, it seems to me that it is vital for the Alliance to continue. The structured part of the Atlantic community must continue because we must encourage those Russian leaders who believe that it would be too risky to start the war. Any desire on the part of the Americans or the British or the Germans to follow the French and to leave the NATO organization. Because, after all, we now have had almost 30 years without war, would lead to the same sad fate as happened to the man who gave up his insurance policy. So much then for the structured part of the alliance, and let me put that together by saying 
that since we have this common problem, there are three ways in which we can manage it in common. The first is consideration of each other's needs. And you will remember that at the very beginning, I said that it is a mistake to treat international affairs in watertight compartments from domestic affairs. Your new president decided to dispense with the services of the chief of staff of your previous president. The Pentagon decided to dispense with the services. And the man who was not employable in the United States was made the supreme commander of NATO. Now, I wouldn't have been surprised if the reaction of your European NATO partners has been, would have been, we are not a dustbin. But in fact, they were rather more statesmanlike. They realized, I'm obviously too emphatic in my remarks. Uh, they, they realized that there was a very great domestic need for an honorable replacement of General Haig, and so they, ha they accepted his appointment, which after all on his qualifications alone is certainly justified. And I would therefore have thought that he is an example where for once the European partners of the Atlantic Partnership have done right. They have shown consideration, understanding of the domestic needs of their most powerful ally and have uh, suppressed the obvious remarks, which I think many of Well, hope springs internal. Of course there is hope. I mean, we must strive for it. But I don't think we must our very justified desire and our very justified hope. Let us overlook the realities. There are, at this moment, three conferences going on, East-West conferences. One is an American-Soviet one on the uh, limitation on, of strategic arms. It's the question of missiles and, and so on. The other is a conference on the reduction of uh, obstacles in the way of East-West relations, which ultimately meets in Helsinki 
and in Geneva. And progress is nil. In the things which matter, progress is nil. Now, I know it is an extremely difficult thing to say. After all, the Americans are having more missiles. The Russians are having more missiles. Who leads it? But even if you go away from the nuclear field, even if you come into the field of what laughingly is called conventional weapons, there is no evidence of Russian willingness to reduce. Now, you might well say there is no willingness of American or European willingness to reduce. I would dispute that. I would say that whatever the military-industrial complex in all our countries would like to do, I think there would be an irresistible force in all our countries if governments could go to their people and say, we have brought you back this absolutely guaranteed offer of reduction from the Russians. There is no evidence. The, the, um, take the <coughs> Russian Navy which is, after all, a new weapon. There is, to my mind, a horrible parallel between the German Empire of before 1914 and the present Soviet situation. There was a general acceptance in the world that the Germans were, because of their geographical position, entitled to have the largest land forces in Europe. Even the French accepted. And people got worried only when, at the beginning of the century, the Germans developed a very strong navy. Because the historic argument that Germany was, had to face wars on two fronts and therefore had to have a very strong army didn't apply to the navy. Now, I know the situation has changed somewhat, but the basic conditions are the same. I think m many people who have been through the Second World War will accept that the Russians have an understandable fear of being attacked again, and that therefore they want the Red Army strong. I think that nobody can deny that. At what level the strength is to be, that's another question. But when you come to something which in its very nature cannot really be squared with a purely defense posture, one is beginning to be a bit worried. Now, I know that some in this room will say, here you have the old, dreary, cold warrior who just hasn't learned anything. Haven't the Russians said we are living in detente? Even President Nixon has said we are living in detente, and this fellow just won't believe it. Well, if you spell detente, which after all is a French word, if you spell it C-O-L-D-W-A-R, then I'll be willing to call it detente. <laughs> but the sad fact, which I can assure you does give me no pleasure, no more than you, is that there is no evidence, there's no evidence on two points. On point one, and I underlined that, that the Russians are readily poised to start a huge war any moment. I see no evidence of that. But the last is also no evidence that the Russians are aiming at detente in the sense in which we understand it. I think provided we keep a minimum, the minimum necessary of defense, we have a very good chance to avoid a big war with Russia. For the reasons which I've given before, that I don't think the Russians will do something which is risky. But if we make it so easy for them, that there is no risk involved for them, then I'm afraid, I fear, I cannot say, on the evidence of the Russian military posture, that never, never, never would they march into Yugoslavia, take over northern Norway, you name it. And that, alas, I know this is unpopular. I know this is very often smeared as being a wicked tool of uh, Wall Street or the Pentagon. I'm neither. But it is. A hard fact, which if you are an academic observer of the political scene, you have to face. This doesn't mean that one shouldn't do everything one can to change it. But alas, it seems to me to be a fact as of now. Yes, sir.
Yes, well, I'm afraid the rising expectations of the third world have been dashed, have been drowned in Arab oil, or rather in the price of Arab oil, just as ours have. And while so far for us this has only meant a certain amount of inconvenience and hardship in very rare cases, of course, for very many countries whose new industries entirely depend on their receiving oil. It is very near a catastrophe, and I find it uh, absolutely right and proper that uh, the Americans, and I wish the Europeans would say it more to the Arabs, you say that you're speaking for the oppressed, the underdeveloped. All right, charge us what you think we can or must pay, but why don't you help the other, other the, the, the undeveloped countries, the poor countries? as we are doing. You now have the money. They all supported you, or almost all supported you, in the war with Israel. They support the Palestinian situation. And yet, you don't do anything for them. That seems to me a legitimate comment made by both your president, your secretary of state. And as I say, I wished, if only to demonstrate Atlantic unity, that. Uh, a French foreign secretary or a British prime minister would say the same, but they don't. You see. In other words, to answer your question, the rising expectation of uh, many of the developing countries, which after all were only that they wouldn't actually starve, have suffered a setback, not through our fault, but through the monopoly uh, exercise of power which we would never tolerate in either the United States or other countries of any monopoly in the United States or in Europe. We're trying to squeeze, because of its monopolistic position, an unreasonable price out of people who need it. We would just not put up with it. There are various middle marines within the individual states within states, how you do that. You have anti-monopoly legislation. Well, at the moment, we haven't got anti-monopoly legislation worldwide. So don't let's beat our breasts and say we are doing too little for the developing countries. Obviously, one is never doing enough. But let us fairly and squarely put the blame where at this particular moment it belongs, which is that the owners and producers of an absolutely vital raw material are ganging up at the rest of the rest of the world, both the rich and the poor. Yes, sir. Well, let me make it quite clear. I never spoke of a common solution to common problems. I only spoke of common management of common problems. That is to say that we combine. Now, I do admit that there is a rather profound, almost philosophical difference amongst Americans and more powers to the elbow and Europeans on the effectiveness of the United Nations. I think it is true that Americans of all political persuasions believe much more in the feasibility 
of common action through the United Nations, as most people in Europe do. I myself would say that it is an absolutely vital instrument of a international living together because there is a way in which people can actually meet, meet informally, exchange ideas and so on. But quite frankly, and that's not the fault of the organization, it's the fault of our, all our governments. We haven't given any teeth to the United Nations. There is good provision within the Charter of the United Nations for a permanent United Nations armed force, a sort of international fire brigade. Not one country, with the exceptions of the Canadians, has been willing to allocate troops to that. And this is only one example. If you look at a situation which I find particularly ridiculous, where is the spirit of the United Nations when all the countries which are against colonization, for example, and which laud democracy, which say that what the world needed was to escape from French, British, uh, German, American imperialism in one form or another. Then, because of political reasons, suddenly get a majority denying this democratic right of self-determination to which they themselves owe their independence in the last 20 years, for example, to the people of Gibraltar. I can assure you the British taxpayer would be delighted if the people of Gibraltar voted in a free election to become Spaniards. Then place is no more any use uh, for war and just costing the British taxpayer a great deal of money. But we feel we cannot hand it over against the will of the people. Now, you would expect that all the 115 new nations created since the war, created because of an inalienable right of self-determination, would support the Gibraltarians on that, not at all. You find ma great majority voting in the, um, in the um, uh, United Nations for the Spanish position for a dictatorship regime, for a fascist regime, which all the colonial countries used to say they were fighting against. Take uh, the situation on whatever, whether the Israelis or the Arabs are right. We can probably argue for a long time. But what sort of power policy is it when the African and many Asian states, who for a long time thought that the Israelis were right, changed sides in order to get oil cheaper. That's not because they have seen the light and they find the inherent justice of the Palestinian position, with which I think one can in many ways sympathize. This is simply power politics. And the last, while well, I think the old nations, the developed nations, must set a good example in thinking worldwide and making more out of the United Nations, I do believe it is justified to say that we are entitled to expect more of a United Nations spirit from the over 100 new states who owe their existence to that spirit which has created the United Nations. So I fear my answer must be the same as uh, to the chairman, I wished I could join with you in saying this is the reality and I have just forgotten it because uh, of pressure of time, but alas, it isn't. So you in the green shirt and the glasses, I know you have been wanting to. Well, let me make it quite clear that I'm not at all a Chinese ex expert. But um, I myself profoundly disbelieve the State Department view, the United States Department view, that we, there again, we have changed from confrontation to detente, and we have changed from two superpowers to five superpowers, namely USA, USSR, China, Japan, and Europe. I honestly believe that they are wrong. As before, there are two superpowers, USA and USSR. Japan and Western Europe are 
powerful economic forces, but neither politically nor militarily, in the top league. And however big China is, to, uh, is, she is today nowhere near in the same category of the Soviet Union or the USA. What will happen by the end of the century, I can't tell you. I'm only dealing with what I know now. And to try and pretend that we have had a tremendous change in the world picture, that instead of the confrontation of USA with her allies and the Soviet Union with her allies, there's now a pentagon of five uh, power structure seems to me quite honest there. Not in keeping with uh, the sort of uh, understanding of politics I would expect from a professor at Harvard. Now, if he had been at Ames, no doubt he wouldn't make that mistake. <laughs> uh, therefore, I do not believe that the power relationship between Russia and China has been changed because Mr. Nixon and Mr. Kissinger have declared China now to be a world power. I do not for one moment deny that China has a potential and that if I have the pleasure when I am about 101 and uh, 40 years to come here again and talk to you, it may well be too that the Chinese potential has developed in such a way that it really does influence and has to influence Russian policy then. But as of now, there's every evidence that the Russians are able to have sufficient forces facing the Chinese and able to have sufficient forces facing NATO in the West. And I personally, you know, don't mind that. I think that if the Russians can feel they aren't going to be attacked, they won't attack us. On the other hand, of course, so already some people who are writing doctoral thesis, you know there's such a demand from graduates for subjects. And uh, people who want to graduate in futurology, we used to call it astrology and it was unrespectable. Now it's futurology and it's become an academic subject. They're all writing, th writing thesis whether it is in the American interest to side with China against Russia and with Russia against China. Uh, of Russia and China, it seems to me totally unrealistic uh, situation. It's much more realistic what the Poles used to say. The Poles used to say the optimists in Poland are learning Russian and the pessimists are learning Chinese. <laughs> I'm sorry to have no more than a rather bad joke to answer your question. Yes, sir. Well, I must say there again, I wish the Europeans were as outspoken as the Americans are. I think the inflation which we have now is by no means solely caused by the Arab oil hike. I'm very, very, very suspicious of any single cause explanation of politics. I'm quite confident there are plenty of other reasons. But undoubtedly, the great upset, the threatening slump which we have, is, has as one of its causes the fact that one of our most vital raw material now costs four times as much as it cost this time last year. This has created an enormous overhang. I've just seen that the uh, Arabs have invested $7 billion in the American economy which seems to me to indicate that the oil sheiks have more confidence in the American economy than has Wall Street. <laughs> and they have invested three billion in the United Kingdom, which if you consider the proportion of size is pretty good. Now, provided this is long-term investment, it's excellent. If it's short-term investment and can for political reasons be withdrawn, then, of course, it's highly dangerous. I just said it's excellent, and that links with your point. It's excellent for the American and the British balance of payments. But, of course, it is absolutely scandalous that it should have gone seven billion to you and three billion to us, and half of Krups is now owned by the Shah of Iran. Krups, the greatest European steel maker and arms maker and uh, engineer. 
when they should have put that money into aid for the developing countries. Maybe with, le with less interest. But if they really are as righteous as they say they are, that's what they should have done. And it opens up a question for us. Were we really entitled, given the needs of the developing countries, to take the money? I suppose the uh, excuse would be, well, if we didn't take it, that wouldn't force the Arabs to give it to the Chad or to the Central African Republic or to Bangladesh for famine relief. They just sit on it or something. So, um, I think potentially there's now a new word in the vocabulary of the political scientists which is called destabilizing. Think what the Arabs could do with uh, their vast money if they start destabilizing Western Germany or the United Kingdom or France or easiest of all Italy. I think this will need enormous careful watching on the part of the Atlantic community that the money isn't used to, to destabilize any of us. I think it's a thoroughly unhealthy situation and anything which we can do to remedy it, uh, there are various things one perhaps not better talk about but uh, which can be done, to my mind is justified and welcome. I think you sir wanted to come in. Well, the question is that uh, he was uh, gratified that they admitted European misbehavior when the Americans proposed sharing of uh, oil resources at the Arab boycott. And now he feels the Norwegians and the British are not willing to join energy. Look, when you or rather the multinational oil companies, which are mostly, but not by no means all, America, decided to stop the boycott by redistributing the oil, which was in fact there. The oil companies, who are in business to make profit, perhaps not excess profits, it's something else, but profits, in fact did this not free of charge. They made the Dutch and the Danes and the rest of their consumers pay. Now, on that basis, I see no reason why the British, who uh, by 1979, or let's be careful, due to that uh, leisurely way of uh, in which British management and labor operate, not only labor, management as well, let's say 1982, we shall be independent of Arab oil, for that matter of Venezuelan or American oil, and we'll be able to export. Now, I see no reason why we shouldn't enter a pool in which we will be willing to put our export, our exportable oil, into that pool at a price agreed by everybody. If the British or Norwegian governments want to do an Arab blackmail on the Americans or the Germans or the Danes, then I'm wholly against it. If the proposal is simply that the British will not sell their surplus to anybody except as agreed by the consumer organization which we will form, as happened in 1973, uh, um, then I think it's fine and I believe both the Norwegian and the British governments just will have to do it and it's stupid of them to say they won't. If on the other hand it means that uh, 
um, British oil or no, uh, Norwegian oil, its production or its uh, uh, rate of production, the rate of flow will be decided by the Americans or the Germans or the French, then I see no reason why that should be so under present conditions. If we get a federal state embracing both sides of the Atlantic, well, then the government for the Atlantic community will decide it. But as long as you have sovereign states, just as the Americans who are delivering, uh, um, let's say, coal, for example, to Europe, the Americans decide the price, which is uh, uh, conditioned by market uh, by market situation. So I think the future net exporters, Britain and Norway, will be entitled to do this. What I think they ought not to be entitled is to decide that they will sell on, on prices which they can enforce because of acute shortages. They must agree to the consumer organization's price. That seems to me right. And if there are any tendencies now not to go against it, well, then they must be resisted. But remember, this isn't where we are now. We in Britain have still got possibly 10 years and certainly more than five years to go before we are independent. And I'm very glad to see that you are changing your policy from project independence to project interdependence. Now, before you all put a little halo around your head, uh, I'm fully aware that you are doing it because you realize that uh, Independence for the United States isn't practicable. But it isn't practicable either for Britain or France, and they have tried to have a project independence. So I think the lesson is the same, which I tried to give in all my paper this evening, that however difficult it is, we really must accept that we now must have joint action in fields which until quite recently we thought at the very expression of our sovereignty. Imagine the Federal Reserve Bank no longer being able, just as it likes, to fix the rate of treasury bills or the prime rate of loans, or the Bank of England no longer being able to do this. We have to accept this. We have to accept that there will have to be coordination, for example, of interest rates. Now, that is quite revolutionary. But nevertheless, it has to come because otherwise, as I've tried to show, there is no way out of the crisis in which we are. Yes, sir. I think the great difference between uh, 25 years ago and now is no longer that then we had rising expectations, which I think we have to put on the back burner now, but also that we had faith in big international organizations. And I think what has happened 